Okay. So it's 930. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first lecture was just, you know, a run through of concepts in chapter one. Um, I hope that went smoothly for you. Um, you know, be sure and work through those, those problems. You should have gotten solutions. If anybody's not getting the emails from me, you need to let me know for sure, because well, that's our main, you know, mode of communication these days. Um, and we will continue this pattern. Um, we will, I will be sending you uh, probably Sunday, Saturday or Sunday, I'll send you uh, the problems assigned. I'll scan the problems because I know maybe not everybody has the same version of the book. Um, they really haven't changed thermo much from the eighth edition to the ninth edition or the seventh edition to the ninth edition. You know, thermo is, at least at this level, is pretty static and has been for a while as far as the concepts. Uh, the problems change, so I'll, I'll scan those problems like I did previously and email that out. So everybody, as far as I can tell, everybody should be good with that. Uh, the tables don't really change much from one version of the book to the next. So uh, Moran and Shapiro is a very good book. Uh, we've tried other books, and there's other good thermal books out there too. Uh, but Moran and Shapiro really has done a good job on their book. Yeah, did you have a question? Yes, so what did you think about the end of the mail? Uh, louder, I can't hear anything. Everything is going to be on the mail. Because when I look for the open the alert, I don't find any of the chapter one on the homework. No, I, I emailed links. The lectures are on YouTube. I'm trying to promote my YouTube channel, oh, say. Okay. I figured this will be retirement income. When, when, when you guys are old and can't sleep, You'll, you'll remember, ah, Cunningham on YouTube. Bam, you're out in five minutes, right? So that's what, but anyway, if you're, like I said, if you're not getting these emails, that's where they are. The links are sent to you. You click on the link and it goes to my channel. And uh, I want you to know I have, at the start of the semester, I had two likes. I expect to see that increase. You know, uh, if I only had a way to know who liked me, say I could assign points, you know, see the more likes I get, doesn't that somehow boost your, surely that boosts you in the, in the YouTube community if you get more likes, I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm just joking, man. I'm just wasting time. Okay, so we're into chapter two today. And chapter two is, is a whole lot better than chapter one and chapter three, four, five, six get to be, I, I think, pretty interesting if you really want to be a mechanical engineer. So with that, uh, the way this starts, we always have the learning outcomes. So this is what you're supposed to get out of uh, chapter two. Uh, concepts related to energy, first law of thermo, uh, internal energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, work, power, heat transfer, heat transfer modes, heat transfer rate, power cycles, refrigeration cycles, and heat pump cycles. Good God, that's a plethora of wonderful mechanical engineering topics. And of course, we just kind of start broaching, you know, we're still flying at 5,000 feet. Well, we were at 10,000 feet, now we're kind of coming down to 5,000 feet, and we'll be at that altitude for a while here. Uh, we're going to analyze closed systems. Closed system means what? the same volume, the, the same mass. The mass can't change. It's not just the same amount, it's the actual same particles can't change at, in the system as we go through the analysis. Uh, energy balances, uh, you know, work through different types of problems. Sign conventions, oh yeah, the bane of mankind. Uh, sign conventions and units but it's just stuff you have to put up with. Uh, we'll conduct energy analysis of systems undergoing cycles uh, a little bit, evaluate appropriate thermal efficiencies. Coefficient of performance. Have y'all heard that term before? COP. You might as well write that down, COP. And really a COP is an efficiency, but it turns out to be a number greater than one. And what I tell people is engineers get kind of antsy 
when they talk about efficiencies greater than 100%, it's kind of like, what is that? How does that work, you know? But a refrigeration cycle uh, can have a, a coefficient of performance of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which means you get eight units of cooling for one unit of work input. Well, that's pretty good, you know? Uh, and you can, you, you can run a heat pump, which will provide heat to a space, or you can run it an air conditioner, which will provide cooling to a space. If you were to provide heat with a heat pump, you get a COP of three, four on a real unit. Electric strip heat, you know, which is just like my, that little chill chaser in my office that I'm really not supposed to have, but it, I freeze to death without it. I plug that in, the COP is one because all it does is convert electrical energy to heat. Well, that's a one-to-one, -one. There there's no cycle going on there. But the heat pump cycle can get you a coefficient where I get three units of heat for one unit of work input. Ooh, that's pretty cool, or warm, as the case may be. So anyway, we'll get into some of that stuff. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, Closed system energy balance. Energy is an extensive property. When I see extensive, I immediately think about a system. And then if I cut that system in half, just, just say I had one half that size, would that property I'm thinking about change? So obviously the total energy in the system, if I take half the mass, I'm going to have half the energy. So it's extensive. It depends on the mass or the extent of the system. So energy is an extensive property that includes kinetic and gravitational potential energy, like from mechanics. Ah, good old dynamics. Did you love dynamics? I didn't like dynamics. That's why I turned into a thermal fluids guy. All this stuff spinning around, that just gave me a headache. You know, I didn't like it. But once I got to this stuff, I go, hey, I like this stuff. So anyway, uh, for a closed systems, energy is transferred in and out across the boundary, which is between what we're studying inside and everything else in the surroundings, by, two, by only two means. We've only got two ways to get energy across, one way or the other, heat and work. And so heat's pretty simple. Work actually can manifest itself in many different forms. And so once you get used to using it, if you have a different form of work, you just have to look up the equation and say, okay, how do I relate, you know, electrical energy, magnetic energy. There's all kinds of different ways that we can couple work into a system. So, it, it, you know, you'll, you'll probably want to pay attention to that. I mean, you don't have to memorize that stuff. You just have to know where it is and understand that's a work interaction. I don't really know the equation to put that into my analysis, but I can go look in chapter two of my thermal book and find it. Make sure you get your units right. Uh, energy is conserved. Uh, we can't create or destroy energy. We change different forms of it. You can have combustion. You're not creating energy. You're taking energy in bonds and stuff like that through a chemical reaction and releasing it but you're not creating energy. It was there in another form. We don't do relativity effects in here. We're not gonna take mass like the bomb or the nuclear reactor and transform a little bit of mass into energy. We don't do that in this course. So that's off the table. Okay. Uh, so we start out when you, develop this first, uh, first law concept, we start out with these word definitions and the concepts, and then we, you know, convert it into terms and equations and stuff like that. So for a closed system, captured amount of mass, the change in the amount of energy contained within a closed system uh, during some interval in time, the change, is equal to the net amount of energy transferred in and out across the system boundary by heat and work during that same time interval. So 
you know, the, the classic example in this is always the piston cylinder. And so you start at condition one, which would be an equilibrium state. And we have some sort of a process and we take it over to state two, we could burn some fuel, we could pull the, the, the piston back, increase the volume, we could push the piston in, we could push the piston in and put a blowtorch under it. I mean, we can do anything you can imagine. And so that's what we're talking about. So the change in energy is equal to the net, you know, net energy exchange by heat and work over that same time interval. Uh, we'll now consider several aspects of the energy balance, including uh, what is meant by energy change and energy transfer, okay? Uh, engineering the change in energy of the system is composed of three contributions. Kinetic energy, gravitational potential, and internal. So kinetic and gravitational are fairly concisely defined and everything else gets kind of lumped into internal energy. So that's the one that's probably new for you a little bit. Okay, so let's look at kinetic. This is straight out of your mechanics. Changing kinetic energy is associated with motion of the system as a whole relative to external coordinate frame, such as the surface of the earth. Okay, so think about the piston cylinder device. Now you got molecules in there that are running around, right? Bing, 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 you know, collisions off the wall and all that. That's kinetic energy, but that's not what we're talking about here. This is the system as a whole. So this kinetic energy is, if you put that piston cylinder on the back of a truck and drove it from here to Nashville, that's kinetic energy of the whole system. It starts at zero. At some point, we may be passing Carthage, we say is 0.2, and you go, wow, I'm going 80 miles an hour. This whole system has kinetic energy because the whole kit and caboodle is moving. That's the kinetic energy we're talking about here. It's not the kinetic energy of the molecules inside the gas, if it's a gas that we're, or the movement of molecules within the liquid, if we're talking about liquid. Okay, it's not within um, the material under study inside the uh, control mass. Okay, and so, and we have to measure that relative to some coordinate system. Okay, so for a system of mass M, the change in kinetic energy from one to two, it's just one half mv squared, you know, v2 squared, one half m times v2 squared minus v1 squared. So that's what you did in dynamics and all that sort of stuff. So that hasn't changed in thermal. Uh, v1, v2, no, no. Initial final velocity, magnitudes, and delta obviously is the difference. I think you're probably familiar with that. Okay? If you got questions, jump in. You know, it's hard. You put these stupid masks on, and nobody wants to talk. I don't really want to talk with this thing on, but you know, I don't, if I don't, I won't get paid. So, what the heck, I'll, I'll talk with it on. Uh, but, you know, people just don't want to interact very much. It, it, I mean, it's like you see people in Kroger and you're not even sure you recognize them because when you put this stuff on, you go, ah, that looks like, that one. I'm not sure. You don't want to embarrass yourself, you know, run up and say, hey, Pete. And it's not Pete. And you go, oh, crap, sorry, I didn't recognize you with that. With your mask on, you know, maybe we should all put our names on our mask, you know, so people could be sure. Um, anyway. Okay, change in gravitational potential energy. Okay, uh, change in gravitational potential energy is associated with the position of the system in the Earth's gravitational field. Again, it's the whole kit and caboodle going from down here up to here or up here down to here. It's not talking about some movement of mass inside that piston cylinder. Okay, that we will describe with internal energy. Uh, for a system of mass M, the change in potential energy from one to two is just as before, um, mg times the elevation relative to some datum would be two 
and mg times the elevation at one. So I think that's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> and we have the coordinates. Uh, acceleration due to gravity. Of course, now, if it's a long ways and gravity changes, then you've got kind of an issue with this. This is assuming what gravity is constant. If gravity is changing, then you'd have to go to an integral relation. You'd have to put an expression for gravity as a function of z, and then you'd have to integrate it from uh, elevation one to elevation two to get the change. Or you could put in an average value for gravity, which if you know, if you're like me, you can't remember how to do integrals anymore. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you, you find ways around this stuff, you know. But anyway, I can maybe do an easy one. I don't know. It's been a long time. Change in internal energy. Okay, the change in internal energy is associated with the makeup of the system, including its chemical composition. Uh, no simple expression for evaluating internal energy change for a wide range of applications. Uh, a lot of times we look up data in tables. When we get to, uh, say, we start boiling water and stuff like that, we can look in the steam table and get a value for internal energy at state one, value for internal energy at state two. Since these are properties, we don't care about the path, you know, so we just get those two numbers and subtract and we've got it. But you get into chemical reactions and all that stuff. I mean, if there's nothing going on chemically, then you don't have to bring it into the problem because there's no change, there's no release. It's just all uh, internal to the system, so you don't worry about it. Uh, like kinetic and gravitational potential energy, uh, it's an extensive, uh, internal energy is an extensive property. So if you cut the amount of mass in half, you cut the amount of internal energy in half, roughly. Uh, we use the symbol capital U for the total, for all of the mass, the internal energy of all of the mass. We, for the, sp the specific internal energy, it is cap U divided by the amount of mass in the system, or the internal energy per unit mass is little u. So if you know the mass and you know little u, you multiply those together and you get big u. So it's pretty simple. Or, God forbid, we could be working with moles, those little furry creature, creatures that run around in the chemistry building <laughs> that you all are so fond of, right? Um, just to review, 6.023 or 022, whatever. They changed the number from when I went to high school. Uh, times 10 to the 23rd is the number of what in a what? Atoms in a mole. Okay. Now we can have pound moles. Say, say we're talking about coal. So uh, they can't see me, too bad. So say we have a pound of coal. I probably hold that in my hand pretty easy. I can have a ton mole, right? I can have a kilogram mole. I can have a gram mole. If I had a ton mole of carbon, that's a pretty good sized pile. That's like 2,000 2, times this little amount I can hold in my hand. Now that number we talked about, does that relate to all of those? Oh, you <laughs> it does? So you're telling me I have the same number of molecules in a pound of coal as I have in 2,000 pounds of coal. The same number of molecules? How can that be? Count them up. One, two, three. It seems like when I get to this pile over here that's like 2,000 times bigger, I got to have more molecules, don't I? So what is that number? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in a gram mole. That's only gram mole. Say in 
you, you come out of chemistry because when you're in chemistry, every, just everything's in grams, right? But you come over here and we do kilogram. Well, so there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23, 24, 25, 26 in a kilogram mole. There's a thousand times more. And if you have a, a pound mole, then you have to convert from grams to pounds. And that ratio times the number of particles. Okay. So um, anyway, in the thermal book, when you see this little flat bar on top, that would be internal energy per mole. It could be per K mole, it could be per gram mole, it could be per ton mole, whatever you're working in. That's what that little hat means. So to get the cap U, you would have to take the U hat times the number of moles, okay? Because that's a, on a unit molar basis. Okay, change in energy. Whoops. All right. Okay, uh, in summary, a change in energy of a system from state one to state two is, and there is our statement of uh, the uh, first law. I mean, we'll see it in lots of other forms, but anyway. So what we're saying is the total energy at two minus the total energy at one is equal to, and we've only got three different bins to put stuff in. U2, internal energy at two, minus internal energy at one, and those are all caps, so that's total for all of the mass. If we write them in lowercase, then it's specific, it's per, K, it, it's per kilogram or per pound, or if, if we put it with a little one with a hat on it, then it's per, per mole. But when they're caps, that's the total for the whole amount of mass that we're working with in our closed system. Okay, so total internal energy at two minus total inter internal energy at one. That's the change in internal energy. And then you've got kinetic energy at two minus kinetic energy at one. Well, if that thing is just sitting here, my piston cylinder is sitting right here on this table the whole time, and it doesn't move, change in Ke is zero. It didn't, it didn't move. It didn't go anywhere. I get to throw that out. If I didn't change it from one elevation to another, pick the whole thing up, then there's no change in potential energy. I get to throw that out. So for the bulk of problems we wind up working, the kinetic energy, potential energy just goes away and it's really just internal energy that we're dealing with, with the closed system. Now, it doesn't have to be. And of course, I will strive to find a problem to send you that violates that just, you know, because I'm evil. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, you, you just, you, you need to work them both ways. But in general, don't be surprised if the delta KE and the delta PE terms go away. Okay. Uh, since an arbitrary value E1 can be assigned to the energy in a system at a given state one, there's no particular significance attached to the value of energy at state one or any other state because you know you, you can set up different um, zero points on a scale in fact that happens you have to be careful when you go from one table to the next some tables like in psychometrics uh, in air conditioning um, in HVAC we have a psychometric chart and its reference point uh, is 32 degrees for like en uh, enthalpy or internal energy, you could say that for now. But the tables in the thermal book, the reference is absolute zero. And so if you start pulling off this chart and this table and putting it together, you go, there's something crazy going on here. Well, they have different reference points. So you have to adjust to the same reference point, you know, if you're gonna mix those numbers together in a calculation. So, you know, the value that you use, other than being consistent, any one number doesn't matter. It's the change in that number from one to two that is really important. Okay. So it's changes in this stuff that, that really have significance uh, in working problems and, and designing things and all that sort of thing. Okay. Energy can be transferred to and from closed systems by two means only work, 
and heat. That's it. That's all we got. Uh, you studied work in mechanics, and we've we talked about a little bit of that already. Um, and those those concepts are still good. However, thermo deals with lots of stuff, phenomena, stuff that's not included in mechanics, and so we will have a broader interpretation of work. And illustrations right now. Okay, uh, well actually this this one is in mechanics, you know, compression, force, force on a spring, you know, you push it down, you got energy stored in that system, or you let up and bingo it, you know, fly, pull a pin and the thing shoots something up in the air. Uh, I think you're, y'all are familiar with that. Um, a gas is enclosed uh, in, a, in a closed vessel is stirred. And you know, it's kind of interesting. I know it's maybe hard to see, but look at the dotted line. You see the dotted line is defining the control mass in there. So you've got a shaft, you got a, a paddle wheel, um, you've got a container, but none of that stuff is the system. The system is just the gas. And so when that paddle wheel spins, it's going to put energy into that container that's going to go into the gas. Is that a heat transfer? If it's not heat transfer, the best way to tell if it's work is ask yourself, is it heat transfer? Because that's pretty clear if it's heat transfer. Work can be murky, you know, because there's lots of, there's umpteen different ways, interaction ways to get energy into something. And if it's not heat transfer, it has to be work if it's a closed system. That's all you got, okay? So the interaction at that boundary is a work interaction that puts energy into that gas, okay? So that's work. And then you, you look in there and I say, okay, well, if I gotta quantify that, well, what do I know? You know, do I know torque in the shaft? Do I know velocity? I mean, I gotta know something so that I can turn it into a number so that I can put it in my energy balance. So it just, you know, so then you gotta dig a little deeper about how do we characterize this kind of work? How do we write an equation where I can take some measurements or figure it out that I can then put a number into my energy balance? There you go, there's a battery. Now that's not, you didn't do that, I don't think, in dynamics. But when a battery is charged, uh, energy is transferred to the battery contents by work. So it, and it, there's different technologies out there, whether it's the old lead acid battery or lithium or I don't know, there's some team. That's a, that's a big area of research, you know, come up with the next greatest battery that would charge in like 10 minutes in your new Tesla, instead of plugging it in for four hours when you're out there on the road, man, You'd have to eat for four hours, good Lord. Ah, oh, man, could probably work on that. But anyway, battery, battery technology is pretty exciting stuff. And there'll be lots of changes as you go through your life in it. So the first two uh, examples of work are in mechanics. The third uh, is the broader interpretation of work, just one example of that that we see in thermo. Okay, symbol W denotes an amount of energy transferred across the boundary of a system by work. Uh, and thermo uh, is often concerned with internal combustion engines, turbines, electric generators, whose purpose it is to do work. It is a convenient, it is convenient to regard work done by the system as positive. Okay, so this sign convention on work is a major opportunity to get wrong answers on problems. So think about it. <clears throat> I got a piston cylinder here, and let's say the fuel goes off and the piston gets pushed out. So that's, that's the system doing work on the surroundings, okay? So 
that work is energy leaving the system. But I'm going to define that, as we'll see, as positive work. Energy leaves the system. Conversely, if I cram that piston, say something else, I, have to, I just shove it in there, I'm doing work on the gas. That's energy going into the gas. But the sign convention says that's negative. So the first law has a negative sign built into it, as you'll see. So, and the negative sign built into it counteracts the negative sign on the work when you shove the piston in, negative and negative makes it positive, and the E2 minus E1 goes up. Now you guys, I'll explain this umpteen times, but you guys need to think about it. Because what happens, you know, you get on a test or get, you're just working something, and you just get the wrong sign on work, okay? Um, it's got to be defined one way. There's some books actually define it the opposite way, which actually makes more intuitive sense to me. But, and, and so they write the first law, instead of with a minus sign on work, they write it with a plus sign. But anyway, so I, I'm just, I'm gonna warn you multiple times that this is a, uh, a point of confusion for our students when they come through thermal one. So you need, you need to concentrate on these, this sign convention for it. And then, he goes on to say in the book, well, this is all true, except that when we put a diagram, we put a direction, we put an arrow on work, and the work then is positive in the direction of the arrow, forget about the sign convention. <laughs> it's a bit of a mess, but I guess when you write thermal books, you, you get forced into some of this kind of stuff. I mean, you can't help it. But anyway, so, I would encourage you to read those portions of chapter two carefully. And I mean, I'll say this over and over again, but um, it's like we go to all this trouble to, to define these sign conventions and you get it down and then we get into another concept and you go, oh, no, no, throw that out. We're just gonna make it positive in the direction that we, we show the arrow. And then if you wanna write the equation, then you have to go back and remember the definition to make sure you put in the sign correctly. It's up to you. See, if it was easy, anybody could do it, right? Yeah. Okay. So work greater than zero is work done by the system. But remember, if it's done by the system, E2 minus E1 has to, what, get smaller. Well, and so if E2 is smaller than E1, that produces a negative sign, but we're saying the work is positive, so we have to have another minus sign in there to counteract that and make it consistent. I'm not gonna say that much more today, but I'll say it plenty in the future. Uh, work done on the system, the definition of the work interaction itself is less than zero, negative. Uh, the same sign convention is used for the rate, okay, um, of energy transfer by work, which is called power. Okay, so right there. So a capital W by, an, by itself is an amount. It's a bushel basket of energy, okay? You put a dot on that thing and it's power. It's the time rate of transferring the energy. Okay. So think about, think about your electrical bill. Has anybody ever seen a commercial, like a manufacturing plant's electrical bill? Probably haven't. Okay, well, I deal with that kind of stuff. So when, you, when, when, when a plant pays its electrical bill, it pays a charge on KW, kilowatts, the peak for the month, and KWH, kilowatt hours. One is energy and one is rate of taking energy. Two different charges and they are roughly comparable, They're like doubles the bill. And so the KW is the rate charge and that little electrical meter is sitting there spinning and looking all the time and it's sitting there tracking that rate. Some guy turns on three motors at the same time he's not supposed to 
and all of a sudden, whoo, that goes really high for an hour and somebody finds it and turns them off. And the rest of the time it's down here. Well, guess what? That KW charge is up here at the peak. Too bad. Shouldn't have turned them on. You don't want to pay for it. Actually, it's a, it's a 15 or 30 minute average, so they give you a little bit of grace. But, but anyway, it's pretty much just a, a rate-based charge. There's a little bit of averaging in there, but it's just, it's based on the rate of taking electrical energy, which is KW. What? Uh, a watt is what, a Newton meter per second? Ooh, that's pretty good for me. I don't, I don't remember much in metric. I have to look all those things up. But I think a watt is a Newton meter per second, so it's a rate. A kilowatt is a kilonewton meter per second, okay? But then, so if you run that for an hour, you know, a kW for an hour is one kilowatt hour. A hundred kW for one hour is a hundred kilowatt hours. And so then that kW basically gets integrated over the month and the area under the curve is energy and you get a separate bill for the energy, okay? So, you know, so that's what we mean. So if you've got a dot over something, it's a rate. If you don't have the dot, it's an amount. Okay. Uh, energy transfer by heat. Hmm. This doesn't seem, seem like there was, let me check something here. I thought there was a bunch of other slides in there in between. Okay, they're coming after this. Oh, okay, all right. I'll make sure I didn't delete a bunch of slides somehow. Anything's possible. I did, I did email this presentation out to you. Okay, so. Energy transfers by heat. Okay, so energy transfers by heat are induced only by the result of a temperature difference. That's it. See, that's why if you've got an energy exchange across the boundary, it's pretty clear to tell when it's heat. If it's not caused by a temperature difference and it's energy exchange, it has got to be work. Okay. Um, between the system and its surroundings, uh, and heat transfer is nice. What if if the heat comes into the system, it's plus. If it goes out of the system, it's negative. Ah, well behaved. Just what you would want. So, there's the the heat transfer term usually doesn't make uh, for any confusion. Uh, we use the Q. You know, I don't know why where this these conventions came from, but anyway. Uh, Q, capital Q is the total amount, and a little Q would be a specific amount per unit mass that's transferred in. Capital Q, total amount of uh, energy transferred across the boundary of the system by heat transfer. Uh, heat comes in positive, heat goes out negative. Perfect. Uh, so Heat positive goes to the system, increases energy. E2 minus E1 is positive. Perfect. Uh, heat less than zero from the system. E2 minus E1 is negative. Well, that makes sense. Okay. Same sign convention is used both for the rate of heat transfer. So you put a dot over it. It's the rate. I like BTUs per hour. You guys will probably like megajoules per minute or something, kilojoules per minute, joules per second, you know, whatever. But whatever time base you want. Okay. Ah, good. Here's a question that'll be on your first test, some form or the other. System undergoes a process involving no heat transfer. It's like when you put your beverage of choice in that ice, in that, 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 that real good cooler, it's pretty much isolated, you know. So you think about that being adiabatic. If there's no heat transfer, it's adiabatic. Just one, you know, one of the terms that, that you need to pick up if you don't already know it. 
Okay, so closed system energy balance. Uh, energy concepts introduced thus far are summarized in words. We'll, 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 we'll put some more math to this shortly. The change in the amount of energy contained within a system during some time from some process from one to two, the net amount of energy transferred in across the system boundary by heat transfer during the same time interval. And then say that minus sign, that's there because of the definition of positive and negative work. Okay. And then the last term is the net amount of energy transferred out across the system boundary uh, by work during the time interval. So that's it. I mean, that's in word form. That's what this first law is. It's just an energy balance on that control mass. And that's the only way that um, this, this thing can change. And that, 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 that first term on the left we will put in the kinetic and the potential energy of the whole system will show up in that and the internal energy shows up over there on the left hand side here in just a minute. Okay, so uh, just in equation form, E2 minus E1, change in total energy of the system is the amount of heat that came in minus the amount of work that was done. Okay. And so that E2 minus E1 breaks down into delta kinetic energy for the whole system on the truck going down the highway or going up the mountain, the potential energy, vertical elevation change, and internal energy. So there, that's really the best way to write it is equation 235B because that kind of breaks out all of the different terms. And, and then when you see that, you go, oh, well, my system's stationary, so I can throw away delta Ke and delta Pe, and I'm down to the change in internal energy. Or if it is moving on the truck going up the mountain, then you know immediately where to put those changes in energy into your analysis. Okay, a minus sign appears before W because energy transfer by work from the system to the surroundings is taken as positive. So that again, that minus sign comes directly from the definition of work. So please work on that and be clear about it. Okay, so you often see this uh, in rate form. It's DE DT, simple derivative is the rate of heat being added by uh, the rate of energy being added by heat minus the rate that energy is leaving by work. Pretty simple. Okay, and then you can put this in uh, word form. So the time rate of change of energy within the system at time t is equal to the net rate at which energy being transferred in by heat at time t minus the net rate at which energy being transferred out by work at time t. So just what you would expect. Okay, how are we doing here time-wise? 13, so yeah, we got, we got some time. Okay, so we'll probably get through this compression work. So for a piston cylinder for, for this closed mass, um, compression expansion work is huge. Okay, and so, and we get this, this is probably the most frequently referenced concept in the first three or four chapters of the book, certainly as far as a, a, a work interaction is concerned. So we need to pay close attention to this. So we got nine slides on it, so we got to figure it's, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, a case having many practical applications, gas or liquid undergoing expansion or compression process will combine in a piston cylinder. And so you see, um, you, you see the, uh, the, the system, uh, the gas or liquid dotted out, kind of pinkish. And so we've got pressure in the cylinder. 
And so the force on the face of the piston is the pressure times the area. You know, so it could be 100 pounds per square inch times 10 square inches, whatever would give you what a thousand pound force pushing out, you know, whatever the, whatever the numbers turn out to be. And then you're sitting there at X1 and then all of a sudden somebody pulls the, the pin that's holding the piston in place and poof, it fires out to X2. You've had a process, right? Okay. And so we've had work. We may or may not have had any heat interaction with the surroundings, etc. Okay, so during the process, gas exerts normal force on the piston. Force is pressure times area. P is pressure at the interface between the gas and the piston, and A is the uh, area. So I think that's that's pretty clear. No problem. Shouldn't be any problems with that. Okay, so from mechanics, remember your work was the good old integral of F dx. And my favorite was always the constant force, right? Because I don't integrate very well. But I can integrate a dx. I want you to know, have confidence in me, I can integrate a dx, right? x2 minus x1. That's my fave. Well, but so in this scenario, F is PA, right? I, 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 I. Goodness, that was fun. Maybe I better see if, do I need to mute somebody? I'll mute him in a heartbeat. Oh man, look at all these people. Ah, I guess we're okay. Okay, so, well, so it's just a simple substitution. So then work for that piston cylinder is the integral of P times A dx, okay? To substitute it in. But we have that piston face, that area A, and if it moves a dx, that's really a volume, right? That sweeps out a little portion of volume. So A dx is really dv. Ah, that's pretty sneaky. So A dx is dv, where v is the volume of the gas, and so we substitute that in and all of a sudden, the work of that piston cylinder is the integral from V1 to V2 of P dV, okay? And you hear all the time in thermal, you hear about P dV work, P dV work, P dV work. Well, this is what it's referring to, just this little substitution into the definition of work, okay? So for a compression, dV is negative, right? Because it, it's smaller. Uh, and so is the value of the integral in keeping with the sign convention on work. Just a comment. Okay, to perform the integral, um, that's this 2.17 is that uh, PDV integral. Well, to integrate it, we have to have a relationship between the gas pressure the interface between the gas and the piston and the total gas volume. So we have to have a function to put in for P. P as a function of volume. Somehow the other way, if, if you're gonna do the integral, you gotta have a function, you know? So that is, becomes an issue a little bit. Okay, so we talked about non-equilibrium type processes, you know, where you don't have a series of equilibrium states you overhear the fuel, the, the spark plug fires, bam, you get the explosion, the piston jumps out here. So during that process, you don't really have a good relationship between volume, pressure, tip, you know, you don't have a good equation of state because it's so chaotic. Okay, so during an actual expansion of a gas, such, such a relationship may be difficult or even impossible. So say if you work for GE, you know, trying to develop and, you know, perfect engines, you, you can't just pull the ideal gas law and stick it in here and integrate it and show, go show it to your boss. They will show you the street. No, 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 no. That, you know, that dog won't hunt. You know, that won't work. Okay. Um, because of non-equilibrium effects during the process. For example, effects related to combustion in the cylinder of an automobile, automobile engine. So, this is the classic example. 
uh, in such applications, the work value can be obtained only by experiment. Or you got to get a much better equation. Get you a good equation. Or do the experiment. Or do both. Do the experiment and then keep trying different, more complicated expressions that are out there in the literature, which you may or may not be able to integrate. And then compare. If you could find one that actually matched the experimental data, oh, that'll get you a Christmas bonus. Because then we don't have to do all this testing all the time, right? That saves money. But they're going to be real skeptical until they compare your relationship that gets integrated to a whole bunch of different tests. And they go, wow, this is pretty good. This is like, you know, within 5% on all of these different tests. That might actually be useful for us. Okay, so uh, equation 217 can be applied to evaluate work of idealized processes. So see, that's where we live in thermal one and thermal two. A lot of processes are idealized so that we get a relationship that we can put in there so we can make you do the integral. And then I check it, you know, with the solution manual. That's, that's, that's how we play this game. Okay, um, the integrand pressure is entirely a quantity of the gas undergoing a process, but not only the, what? <laughs> uh, so you get a relationship between uh, pressure and volume, you put it in there, you can do the integral. But, so for this, we imagine the gas undergoes a sequence of equilibrium states during the process. Such an idealized expansion or compression is called a quasi-equilibrium or quasi-static process. So I promise you this is another term that you will get a question on on your first test to see if you understand basically what it means. So it means as we go from one to two, we do it in these little bitty steps that are very, very close that we can consider that it changes very slowly so we can consider that it goes through all of these little equilibrium points along the way, which means that we have a relationship that works, which means we can put it in there and do the interval. So that's what this is all getting to. And here's a slide, I, I stole this off the internet this morning and stuck it in there because I thought it was pretty good. So. The way, way you relate this is you got your piston cylinder, you got your gas or liquid in there, and then you got all these weights sitting up on top of it. But each one of those little weights, you can take a pair of tweezers and take them off one at a time and throw them in the trash can. And so I say, in, you know, so compare this, the real process may be fuel exploding in the, in the piston that poof, fires it up immediately, but we're going to simulate this by taking these little weights off one at a time, take one off, then comes to equilibrium. Take another one off, comes to equilibrium. Take another one off, and you know, an hour and a half later, we got all the stupid weights off. And, but that's the process that we're simulating with this integral, because we're gonna use this equation of state, and it'll give us an answer, you know, if we can do the, if we can do the integration and put the numbers in, then we'll get an answer the question is, does that answer for work have anything much to do with the real process that we want, which is where the fuel explodes in the piston? And the answer is it's probably not very close. You know, maybe off 50, 60, 70%, you know. But in thermal one, we're gonna make you do that integral anyway. Okay. Questions? Yes, sir. Loud. What was the second What's that? I'm sorry. What's the second? Oh, quasi-static. Other books, other books call it a quasi-static process. <clears throat> quasi-static, quasi-equilibrium, same thing. And so this one illustrates it pretty good. We don't have quite as many weights, but so you know, you, you start out with high pressure, low volume, you take that top weight, you throw it off, and bingo, the thing pops up to that first point right in there. You let it sit there for a minute, calm down, then you pull off the next one, next one, next one. And then you put a smooth curve through that, and you say, wow, the area under that 
is the integral of P dV, and that's my work. Okay. Um, you can look at it. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, quasi equilibrium expansion, gas moves along the pressure volume curve or path as shown. Uh, so we can apply the equation for work, work done uh, by the gas on the piston uh, is basically the area under that curve. Okay, so notice that little delta W and then notice the, the area, the area is the integral of P dV and the work is, the, is, the, is that little strip of work is delta W. Why do we use a delta for W and a D for volume? They're both differential quantities. Because the volume is a property. So in this book, if they put the little D V, that's a differential change of a property. Work is not a property. Work is path dependent. And so they use the delta for an incremental amount of work. That's actually kind of handy, you know, because every time they write the equation, once you realize that and remember it, you can just look at it and say, ah, okay, those are path dependent, those are properties based on whether it's a D or a delta. Does that make sense? I don't know. Okay, so work, this little strip of work, but work is not a property. So a, 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 an infinitesimal little piece of work we indicate as delta W, but volume is a property. And so we indicate a, a, a small piece of volume as DV. Yes, sir. Delta W, would, that be, would you consider that power? Uh, well, no, no, because that's, the power is the rate of doing work. There's no, you don't have time up here. But, but uh, I mean, if, if you plotted, if you plotted it up versus time, say if you plotted work versus time, then so you'd have to have work where you got pressure, you'd have to have work and then you'd have time and then the integral of work over time, or, or the rate of doing work is power. So I guess, well, yeah. Or I guess you'd have to plot what the rate, and then you'd integrate it times dt to get the amount. I said that backwards. Yeah, but no, that's not, uh, you don't have any rate up there. Okay, uh, when the pressure volume relation required uh, to evaluate work in a quasi equilibrium expansion or compression is expressed as an equation, evaluation can be simplified. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, we run into polytropic processes and we'll talk a lot more about those later. That's a longer discussion. But the general expression for a polytropic process is pressure times the total volume raised to some constant exponent n is constant, okay? And like it says, n is a constant. So that's called polytropic process. So uh, we can have different values of the exponent for different types of processes, but for n equals one, you know, v to the one is just v, so that says that pressure times volume to the first power, or volume, is a constant. So we put that into the uh, integral expression. Um, we get the expression at the bottom, a constant times uh, the natural log of V2 over V1. And if you know, usually when you do these problems, you know either the starting state or the ending state. And so you see, if pressure times volume at any point is constant, if I know the pressure at one and the volume of one, then I know the constant. I just multiply them together. And so that's the value of the constant. Or if I know it at two, 
The issue is if I know the pressure at one and the volume at two, then uh, I'm gonna have to do some more scratching around, okay? Now, I was just playing around with this. You know, normally I would write some stuff on the board, but you know, with this recording, it's kind of awkward. So I did some of this. I dusted off of my, my equation programming in Excel today, it didn't take too long. And so, you know, I just figured I'd go ahead and uh, go through the steps on this a little bit. So, you know, that's our 217 work as the integral from V1 to V2 of PDV. There's our polytropic expression, PV to the N is constant. So if N is equal to one, then I get PV to the one is constant, which is then equal to P1, V1, or P2, V2. And so what you do is you take this and you solve it for uh, pressure as a function of volume. Well, so pressure is equal to the constant divided by the volume. You just, you know, divide, divide this equation by V and substitute it in for the P. Oh, and I'll, I'll email you. I mean, you're all welcome, to, of course, to, to take notes, but I'll email you this little Excel sheet if you want. Um, yes, sir. Well, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. You I mean, say that again louder. The, right? the, the homework you sent it to us. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was really confused on it. How did you use that? Like, what did you use to get the answer? Like, what formula you used for the answer? That was, that was. Okay, well, why don't, why, why don't we talk about that? you know, after class or come by during office oh, hour or something like that. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that particular problem. By the way, that, uh, that problem 35, there's a, that, that first answer, the answers are wrong. So somebody, I feel rich. I don't know. I don't know, Rich. Rich, are you in here? <laughs> anyway, he emailed me. We went back and forth a little bit. And if you just check the math on that first equation, it says it's equal to what? Four or six. And it, it's a number like 28 or 30 or something. Like that. I mean, they just punch. The, the equation's right, they just punched it wrong in the solution, so you can, you can fix that. Um, okay, so here, th this is our equation of state. PV is equal to a constant. So we have to solve this for uh, P equals the constant divided by volume, and then we substitute that in for P, and so we get this, and then constant pulls through the integral sign. And so we integrate V1 to V2 of dV over V, which you know integrates into the constant, but the constant is P1 V1 or P2 V2, whichever one you happen to know, times the natural log of V2 over V1. So that just shows the integration of that kind of step by step. Okay. Okay, so I think we're, I think we're finished that one. Okay, uh, since non-equilibrium effects are invariably present during actual expansions and compressions, the work determined with quasi-equilibrium modeling is at best an approximation, as we've said, uh, to actual work. So you have to be concerned about that. And it just depends on uh, the particular process, how close it'll be. Okay. Um, I, think, I think I'm gonna quit here, because I mean, I'll run through, we got like three or, three or four classes for this chapter. I'll run through this whole chapter today. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go cram it down you that fast, but uh, we're not gonna quit now. I've got, I've got some other stuff for you. I don't let you out early, I'm sorry. That's just the nature of the beast. Let me see what I can find. But, um, oh, we're well, here. So, let's see. This, these are some slides that 
I was lucky enough to take a trip to the Ukraine in December with a couple colleagues from uh, Oak Ridge. And I just, there's a couple of, well, we can't do all of this, but what do we got? We got, we got a few minutes here. Okay, so these were some slides we did. We were over there for a week and we were doing uh, some training on industrial process heating equipment and energy recovery. And so um, I'll ask Oak Ridge if I don't know if I can send these to you or not. If it's okay with them, I'll send them to you. But this, this, this was like our last presentation. But it's, it's looking at uh, recovering energy from exhaust gases on like big uh, heating furnaces. And there was one thing that kind of dovetailed with this piston cylinder thing that I thought I'd show you. But uh, this shows you uh, basically uh, temperatures of exhaust gases of different industrial processes. And you know, you can have distillation columns, um, calcining, uh, metal melting, aluminum, that sort of thing. Uh, steel mill, I mean, my gosh, you can, you can have some pretty darn hot exhaust gases. And there's a lot of energy that goes to atmosphere that could be recovered and used productively. So the purpose of this uh, was to look at, you know, a bunch of different, uh, this is sources and uh, we don't have time to go through all of this. Uh, but let me, there was one thing that was down here that's pretty interesting. Um, these were actually, some of these slides I contributed to, but there was stuff in here, uh, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but this was pretty cool. I, I was not aware that this was out there. And you all just for the heck of it might want to Google this. I hate the way I, okay. So this is the Deluge. I'm not sure how to pronounce Deluga, Deluge, whatever, natural energy engine. And so what this thing is, this is, yeah, an engine, this can replace a motor, this can replace, you know, an engine, uh, whatever. And it works on the expansion of a liquid. Liquid CO2 apparently has a high expansion as you change temperature. It's not, it's not boiling, it's not changing phase, it stays liquid the whole time. And so they have, um, they, they talk about this triple piston cylinder set, uh, and they heat this stuff up and they cool it down. And I, you know, I guess, I guess you heat it up in the cylinder and it expands and then they, they, they take it out and they exhaust it and they cool it down again and it shrinks. And so the, 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 there's a company, the Luge uh, Natural Energy Engine, if you Google that, they sell a 350 horsepower uh, engine that they, but this was basically developed for oil field stuff where they had a lot of heat. You know, if you're out there drilling in the field, you don't have much electricity. You know, that electricity is hard, but heat is easy because you got oil, you got natural gas. I mean, I just pull some natural gas, burn it, you know, in a burner and, you, you know, so uh, that is what I think that this was uh, defined for. So you see it requires 180, degree plus water, uh, approximate cost, $2,000 a KW, not including installation, maintenance, claimed efficiency, 23% based on heat to power conversion, which isn't great, but hey, if you're out there in the oil field, and natural gas isn't worse. I mean, you know, you do sell it, but out there, I mean, come on. We need to use some natural gas. We'll use it. You know, we're drilling the dig. You know, we're pulling it up out of the ground. So, let's see. Cycle description: Liquid CO2 is pumped to supercritical pressures. Okay, so that's just right now. You don't. We haven't talked about. We haven't gotten into the 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 the, the diagrams and supercritical and subcritical and all that. But we will. That's chapter three. So that's coming pretty quick. But anyway. Uh, liquid CO2 is pumped to a very high pressure, uh, accepts cycle heat at the recuperator, which is just a heat exchanger, and waste heat uh, at the waste heat exchanger. So they're putting energy into uh, uh, to a, a couple of different heat exchangers. Um, 
high energy, uh, that's super critical CO2, that's just high pressure CO2, is expanded, which means that pressure is dropped at turbo alternator producing high frequency electrical power. Um, but this guy, so basically we're, we're, we're putting heat into and out of this. You have to have some cooling uh, mechanism as well. But the expansion in these piston cylinder drives this pump, which is uh, pretty cool. So you see we got liquid hot, it comes out cool. Uh, we're pulling more energy out of it. And then we're, we're dumping heat to the atmosphere over here. I hadn't looked at this in a while, I just pulled it up this morning. But anyway, so that's something that you might want to look at for your own. Uh, let's see, I, I went to the website. Their website isn't uh, great. Th this is their uh, website where they talk about this. Welcome to Deluge. World needs a new engine. Okay, I guess I'm over time anyway. But, um, you, you know, you might want to Google that. They, they've got in it. They, they talk about all the different aspects of this in here. So, anyway, with that, I will... Uh, let you guys go and uh, we will continue on on Tuesday. So hope you have a good weekend and stay safe.